Hey, everybody, this is Dr. Gundry. I'm delighted today to have a good friend who I've gotten to know over the last couple of years, Mac Lukavir, who's got a great new book out called Genius Foods. Uh, Max was kind enough to send me an advanced copy, and quite, quite frankly, I couldn't put it down. I thought that, uh, and don't, don't get blushing, there it is, Genius Foods. And Max, you know, you've got an amazing personal story about how this came about. And why don't we start with sharing everybody how the heck a guy like you uh, ended up writing a book like this? Yeah, so my, that's a great question. First of all, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. You know, I'm a big fan of your work and I've interviewed you many times. So it's kind of cool to have the tables flipped. Um, my background is in journalism. So I uh, began as a health and science journalist. Um, as soon as I graduated from college, I began working for a TV network. Uh, that really allowed me to cut my teeth with some of the best journalists, Peabody award-winning journalists in the field. And when I left that full-time job to explore what I was going to do with the rest of my career in my you know, late 20s, uh, it was then in my personal life that my mother started to um, display signs of memory loss and cognitive decline. My mom was a young person. She was 58 at the time. She was vibrant. Uh, she had blonde hair, not that blonde is necessarily a sign of, uh, uh, or a marker of youth, but, but, um, but, you know, my mom was as spirited as, uh, you know, a New Yorker is. My mom is a, a born and bred New Yorker, fast talking, fast walking, ran a business, raised three children. And it was at the age of 58 that my mom started to show the earliest signs of dementia. She also had a change to her gait, which is the way that she walked. Um, and this is something that became very apparent to me and my brothers. But because I had no prior family history of any kind of dementia, um, we were at a complete loss as to what might be going on with my mom. I mean, I didn't even know it at the time. Um, but, you know, movement is something that is by and large dictated by your brain health. Um, I thought that it was a muscular thing or that my mom just needed to get to the gym and stretch more. But lo and behold... Um, the journey to try to figure out what it was that my mom had led to me visiting some of the top neurology departments in the United States. I remember distinctly um, going to the U.S. News and World Report's annual listing of neurology departments and making check boxes um, to try to figure out which which department we would go to first in search of answers. And it, the journey culminated with my visit um, to the Cleveland Clinic with my mom. And uh, you know, the Cleveland Clinic, what I heard about it back then was that they were known for really assembling a team to help diagnose complex medical problems. And it was there that my mom was diagnosed for the first time with a neurodegenerative disease. She was pre prescribed drugs for both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, even though her symptoms didn't fit neatly into either diagnosis. And that was probably one of the most traumatic experiences of my entire life. I was uh, not really told much about my mom's condition in the doctor's office. He ran a bunch of strange tests um, that, uh, you know, are very kind of uh, surreal and almost absurd to the, to the lay person's eye, to the untrained eye. And they, he essentially prescribed these biochemical band-aids without telling me much about what they do or, or recommending any kind of dietary or lifestyle intervention that might help um, my mom. So when I got back to the hotel that weekend uh, and I started to Google the drugs that my mom was prescribed, um, it dawned on me that my mom was prescribed drugs for both of these diseases and that they have no disease modifying effect and that they are highly limited in their efficacy um, to boot. So I was traumatized. I had a panic attack and I basically decided from that point on that I would learn to the best of my ability from the leading experts in the field what would lead a person to develop dementia. Because, my, because I had no prior family history of the disease, I had a hunch that there had to be something in the environment that was contributing to what I was seeing in my mom. And I started looking into PubMed, into all the primary literature, um, to really look at the uh, associations and the mechanisms at play that would um, lead a person living in the in the Western world to develop this disease, 
And then I began reaching out to scientists and researchers around the world, and that culminated in my writing Genius Foods, which basically is a seven-year journey. All of the insights that I've learned from the top researchers in the world, self-experimentation, population studies, clinical trials, animal studies. It's really what I think to be um, a synthesis of the best available evidence in terms of how we might live to protect our brains and also enhance them. Great. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things I like about the book is uh, this is often very dry scientific material. And, it, it, you know, sometimes it takes a, a degree in neurology and training in neurology to even make sense of these things. But what I think you've been able to do uh, for, for the lay reader, which is obviously who this book is for, is to distill uh, these really complex uh, things and put them into actual items. You know, I, through the years, I've become good friends with uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who I think you've met, you know, who wrote The End of Alzheimer's. And one of the things uh, that Dale has taught me, uh, actually, Dale's wife taught him. Dale was a, was a bench researcher and uh, an excellent bench researcher researcher, particularly on how the ApoE4 gene works and behaves. But his wife, who is a practicing physician, uh, they love to tell the story. She finally one day said, you know, all this bench research is great, but, you know, why don't you put this into action with real human beings uh, rather than with a bunch of mice? And he says, well, gee, well, that's an interesting concept. So, you know, taking this very complex stuff and dialing it down to actionable items, I think, is really where your book has a, is going to have a really profound impact. And congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, you know, as a young person speaking for the millennial demographic, um, you know, I, I know that dementia is not something that's on the minds of most millennials. You know, they're like, when I talk about my passion for dementia prevention, they say, you know, come back to me in 40 years. But the reality is that Alzheimer's disease begins in the brain 30 to 40 years, if not more, before the first symptom. I mean, Parkinson's disease, which is the second most common neurodegenerative disease, by the time you show your first symptom, 50% of the dopaminergic neurons, the neurons involved in movement in the part of the brain, the substantia nigra, affected by Parkinson's disease, are already dead. So Genius Foods, to me, really was about... Um, Trojan horsing the best information when it comes to preventing Alzheimer's disease, um, which is, you know, now uh, the, the conversation surrounding prevention in Alzheimer's disease finally is in the zeitgeist. But, you know, when I began writing it four years ago, um, nobody was talking about Alzheimer's as a preve potentially preventable disease. So it's the best synthesis of Alzheimer's prevention um, and everything that we know about the prevention of other neurological conditions. Um, but it's, it's packaged in the language of performance because what I learned over the course of my research is that the same things that you can do that will shield your brain against the modern world and protect it and help facilitate healthy cognitive aging also make your brain work better in the here and now so that you can have more energy, you can have more mental uh, resilience, cognitive clarity, um, the same factors that are, that act um, as a neuroprotective, um, you know, as, as, neuro, as, as offering neuroprotection, also improve executive function, which some researchers believe is more important to a person's success than IQ. So it, it is a, it, offers a lot for the person just trying to improve the way that their brain works day to day. But again, it's a Trojan horse because, you know, people that aren't necessarily my goal, my secret goal, Dr. Gundry, is that people that don't know that they're interested in dementia prevention are going to pick it up and inadvertently potentially prevent their own dementia. So that's, that's really my, my passion. And, um, you know, I've seen the monster that is dementia. I see it every single day. And so, you know, the fact that my mother, um, has a form of dementia, has kept me very honest in terms of the way that I communicate science, the, the degree of hope that I offer for people that are already affected by um, cognitive decline. Um, and it, it makes me want to really uh, communicate the science with the level of optimism that I feel while also doing it responsibly. Because I think that's the most important thing. We live in a time where, you know, information is ubiquitous. It's coming at us 24-7. But at the same time, it's become ever more difficult to um, know what's true and know what's hype. 
And um, you mean fake news exists? Come on. It, it you know it does exist. It does exist. Me, you know, some of our most trusted media outlets um, are more driven by driving clicks to their websites than actually making people healthier. And this is illustrated by headlines that you often see about health. You know, one day you'll see a headline that fat is back, and the next day you'll see a headline that high fat diets are damaging to the brain. The reality is that fat is our brain's friend. You know, our brain is constructed of fats, and the kinds of fats that you eat moment to moment weigh in very heavily on the performance of your brain as well as its predilection for, di for disease. So... Um, these nuances are often lost in the media, and in Genius Foods, I really try to separate uh, fat from fiction, so to speak. Cute. Love it. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the things uh, I've had the pleasure of presenting at uh, some of the neuro conferences at Stanford and Harvard, MIT over the past year, and some of the, just speaking of fat in the brain, I think most people should realize that our brain is 60 to 70 percent fat and half of the fat in our brain is a component of fish oil which is called DHA and interestingly enough the other half is actually arachidonic acid uh, which gets the evil omega-6 uh, I've always told people if arachidonic acid was that evil then why is your brain you know half arachidonic acid and there's now been some beautiful studies of MRIs of people's brains as they age. And people who have the highest omega-3 index, which is basically looking at EPA and DHA attached to red blood cells over a two-month period, the people with the highest index of omega-3s have the biggest brains and the biggest areas of memory, the hippocampus. And the people who have the lowest levels of omega-3 have the most shrunken brains and the smallest areas of hippocampus memory. And that's actually, you know, number one, scary stuff, but it's also, as, as you point out, empowering because a simple change in diet, and maybe you can elaborate on that, can just give your brain the fat it needs to actually work. Absolutely. Um, you know, researchers speculate that it's access to DHA fat from fish, from, you know, properly raised, pasture-raised animals that catalyze the growth of our brains. So the, that's why today in the modern world, the consumption of foods that are rich in these fats are associated um, with bigger, more robust brains. And one of the mechanisms behind that is that DHA fat promotes the uh, upregulation of a powerful growth hormone that's been called miracle grow for the brain. Um, its proper name is BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And you can actually sprinkle BDNF on neurons in a Petri dish, and you actually will see them sprout dendrites, which are thought to be the physical correlates of memories, in that Petri dish, like a, like a chia pet. You just sprinkle BDNF on those, on those neurons. And that's actually, BDNF is increased when we consume more uh, DHA fat. Simultaneously, um, inflammation is a well-known brain drain when it comes to uh, BDNF. And the other component of fish oil, EPA, is a really powerful anti-inflammatory. So you've got those two fatty acids working in tandem to help promote healthy brain volume. You've got DHA fat and you've got EPA fat. And these foods are, or these fats rather, are omnipresent in fatty fish, the fat of, of wild salmon, sardines, which I love, mackerel, herring. Um, these are all powerful brain foods, um, and in fact, genius foods, uh, as we highlight them in the book. And also, they're found in appreciable amounts in the fat of grass-fed beef, um, much smaller, much, much, to a much lesser degree than in fatty fish, but they're present, um, as well as in omega-3 enriched or pasture-raised eggs. Um, many people, right. the, the conversation around um, omega-3 fats um, sometimes includes uh, plant-based forms like from flaxseed oil um, and chia seeds. I know you're not a fan of chia seeds, um, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, these are, these are actually not very efficiently um, converted to their usable forms in the human body. So I like to make the recommendation that people should really opt for preformed uh, EPA and DHA from fish oil, if you're a vegan or vegetarian, algal oil, 
um, is helpful or krill oil. Very beneficial. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I take care of a lot of uh, vegans and vegetarians in my practice who have made the mistake uh, with, with good intention of using flaxseed oil as a source of omega-3s without realizing that these are short-chain omega-3s. And our enzyme system to build short-chain omega-3s into long-chain omega-3s is, is very poor. Uh, a fish, on the other hand, is, is superb at doing this. And I see all of my vegans uh, have really nice levels of short-chain omega-3s, but they have absolutely no DHA and EPA. And it's, it's completely now replaceable with algae-based DHA. And um, there's no reason not to do that. You're correct. Uh, a number of my vegans and certainly my vegetarians uh, will take krill oil, uh, thinking that, well, that's uh, a, a harmless sort of plankton. And, but one of the important things about krill oil, and I have a lot of patients who try to use krill oil, there's not much DHA mm -hmm. in one of those capsules of krill oil. And I'll have people say, oh, I take krill oil and it's much better than fish oil. And when we actually measure the DHA in krill oil eaters or swallowers, they just don't get enough. So mm -hmm. you got to take a lot of krill oil. Yeah, yeah. And also EPA, which is, uh, you know, a right. to a much less appreciable degree in krill oil. And and finally, the trials, the actual science, um, it's much more limited when it comes to krill oil uh, when compared to fish oil. There's a bounty of, of research being done on fish oil, um, and that uh, degree of research does not exist um, for krill oil. So I think, you know, if, you're, if cost is an issue, which I know for most people it is, um, fish oil is really the best, the best way to go. Yeah, and most commercial fish oil now is molecularly distilled, so you really don't have to worry about mercury or other toxins in, in most of the uh, you know, good quality fish oil out there. And even Costco sells uh, a couple of good uh, fish oil products. They have a couple bad ones too, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, so, okay, so, all right, we're going to build our brain with uh, fish oil, with DHA and EPA. Um, what are some other usable steps? And let me, let me before you say that, uh, obviously millennials, uh, when, when I was a baby boomer, we knew we were going to live forever and never suffer anything that happened to our parents. And, you know, our parents were really stupid. And then we became our parents. And it's nice to see actually millennials are the current new baby boomers. Sorry about that, but you are. And one of the things that's important to realize is that when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, uh, there was really very, very lim limited dementia. Um, we knew of, you know, one old person who wasn't very sharp anymore. But for the most part, it did not exist. There were not nursing homes, you know, spanning blocks with full-time caregivers of people. They just did not exist. And uh, we now, as you are well aware of, have this epidemic of dementia. And we've seen it really in two generations. Um, really, actually, my generation was the, the first, I mean, our parents was the first generation that this has happened to. And I think in your world travels, you've, I'm sure, run into societies where dementia is an incredibly tiny, tiny portion of late adulthood. Abs Can you explain that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there have been studies done on Japanese nationals. Um, you know, people that live in Japan uh, have typically low rates of Alzheimer's disease. There's a very low risk. Um, but what happens when those Japanese nationals move to the United States, they have rates that mimic um, the incidence that you see in your average American. So it seems that um, there's something about the Western diet and lifestyle that is interacting with our genes in a harmful way when it comes to our brain health. You could also take a look at the Yoruba people in uh, Ibadan, Nigeria, um, where the APOE4 allele is very common. It's just as common there as it is here, and yet it has little to no association with Alzheimer's disease. So what that suggests is that 
the increased risk that we see in carriers of the APOE4 allele, which by the way make up 25% of the population, so one in four viewers watching this are going to carry that allele, it seems to be more an interaction between uh, that gene and the Western way of life, the Western dietary pattern, that really seems to put a person at increased risk for this disease. The APOE4 allele might be the canary in the coal mine for the Western way of life. And what that suggests is that if you have this allele, which puts you at anywhere between 2 and 14 fold increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease in the United States, you could just move to Ibadan, Nigeria and see that risk completely abolished. So to me, that is a really strong indicator that um, the soaring rates of Alzheimer's disease that we're seeing today, which by the way are expected, numbers are expected to triple by the year 2050, really is the function of a diet that's become saturated in refined processed carbohydrates, unhealthy industrial grain and seed oils, um, a sedentary lifestyle, chronic stress. I mean, these are all factors that uh, play a role in positive or negative brain health. So, you know, for people out there that are concerned about the APOE4 allele, and actually that's one of the uh, reasons why I discovered your work many years ago is because you talk a lot about the APOE4 allele, which I'm very passionate about um, the nutrigenomics surrounding this allele because many people carry it, and it is the most well-defined yeah. Alzheimer's risk gene. So I think it's, uh, f it's fascinating at the very least. But on the other hand, um, you know, looking at the associations um, that really seem to interact with it and put a person at higher risk is really important in terms of steering a population away from Alzheimer's disease, which is a horrific disease for which there is no meaningful treatment. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, I have a number of uh, people with the APOE4 gene now in their mid 90s. Uh, who uh, are perfectly bright. Uh, they uh, they drive to see me. They remember my name, and most importantly, they know their way home, uh, which becomes very critical as you get older. And uh, one of them in particular has always struck me. Uh, she's a black woman who grew up in North Carolina, and uh, she I I met her in her late eighties, and she was bright, and she carried the APOE four. And I said, you know, t tell me, I said, man, this is impressive. You know, you're smart and all this. Uh, what, what do you eat? And she said, well, it's really interesting. I, I came uh, out of the box wanting to eat greens and I could not eat enough greens. And I really didn't, wasn't very interested in meats and things like that. And all I wanted was big plates of collard greens and all these greens and I said, you know, it's fascinating. I said, you know, you didn't know it, but you you chose the right diet hmm. for your gene or coming out of the box. And you're right. The Nigerian studies are fascinating because they do carry a very high percentage of the APOE4. And there have been age match controls with blacks in Indianapolis, and I'm sure you're aware of. And in fact, the Nigerians, despite carrying the APOE4, they don't get Alzheimer's disease, whereas their age match control blacks in Indianapolis do. Hmm. And it's it's clear that this is an environmental food-based problem. And so let's get back to, okay, so we've got fish oil everybody's getting. What other things are, are you going to have, particularly millennials do, so that you know they're not drooling in their oatmeal when they're 60 years old? Yeah, so I mean, in Genius Foods, I really take strides to make all of the recommendations actionable. So, um, one of the top things that people can do every single day is eat a huge fatty salad. People kind of laugh at me on Instagram because I tag my salads with hashtag huge fatty salad. Um, but it's really important. You know, research out of Rush University shows that people who eat uh, a, a large bowl every single day of dark leafy greens have brains that look on scans 11 years younger. And when I say a fatty salad, I don't mean throwing cheese and tortilla strips and ranch dressing <laughs> on top of that salad. I'm, oh, no, really? Yeah, I mean, sorry to break it to you, but no, I'm a huge fan of extra virgin olive oil. There's no better vehicle for extra virgin olive oil than a salad. I'll consume uh, kale, which is a powerful 
um, source of magnesium and uh, soluble fiber, which feeds the gut bacteria, spinach, which is a top source of magnesium and folate, which the brain needs to create energy, um, and arugula, which is a top source of dietary nitrate which is really good for the healthy functioning of all of your blood vessels. Um, and I'll douse it with extra virgin olive oil, one or two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Um, and I eat that every single day along with some, you know, I'll throw some apple cider vinegar in there, maybe some lean protein uh, or not so lean protein, um, an egg perhaps. Um, and, uh, and that's a really good way, eating a large daily salad every single day. You know, a lot of people think about salads um, in terms of you know, weight loss and satiety and things like that, but it's a really powerful way of checking off so many of your nutritional boxes. I mean, you're getting chlorophyll, which is rich in magnesium, you're getting dietary fiber, you're getting that extra virgin olive oil, which um, recent studies have shown in animal models that of all the fat types, extra virgin olive oil really seems to promote uh, longevity. Um, when looking at mice, which, you know, it's easy to do these studies because mice only live about two years. Um, so in terms of the oil that you want to really have in your diet for liberal consumption, and I know you agree with this, uh, is, is really extra virgin olive oil. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm a huge fan of physical exercise. You know, physical exercise is really one of those things. Um, Genius Foods focuses on the foods that you can eat that are going to improve the way that your brain works, but there is also a very significant, um, lifestyle, uh, component to the book. And I talk about the kinds of exercise that you can do to really optimize brain function, um, as well as uh, a new type of exercise that I highlight in the book, and that is thermal exercise. So recent research, very new research out of Finland, has shown that people that use sauna therapy um, four to seven times per week have a remarkable risk reduction for developing dementia, about 65%. And this is very striking um, uh, news because... You know, in Finland, sauna use is sort of like taking a shower. It's so common in Finland because Finland is the sauna capital of the world. On average, there's one sauna per household. If you were to do that same study in the United States, I would say, well, people that have access to saunas usually have expensive gym memberships and things like that, right? This is why I think it's so important to understand how science is done. Um, because, you know, taking this research done out of Finland really tells us that, you know, there might be something to that link. And actually, when we look at what uh, heat therapy um, does for the brain, it's, it's pretty powerful. Essentially, heat um, exposure activates proteins in your body called heat shock proteins that act like little scaffoldings. Like You see scaffolding on the side of a building? They act like scaffolding for your proteins to prevent them from misfolding. Now, this is really important because when you take diseases like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, these diseases are known as proteopathies. So basically, they're related to misfolding of proteins in the brain, amyloid beta in um, Alzheimer's disease and alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's disease. So essentially, by doing physical exercise, you activate these same proteins. By sitting in a sauna, you're activating these same, same proteins. They act like scaffolding to prevent those proteins from becoming misfolded, which would then allow them to clump up potentially and form the plaques that uh, characterize these diseases. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, yeah. I mentioned in my first book that um, actually I got interested in heat shock protein cause it was a way of preventing, uh, cardiac cells, heart cells from dying during occlusion during a heart attack. And we could do heat shock conditioning to prevent this from happening. And so, uh, in my, in my first book, I recommended that during the summer, everybody needs to come to Palm Springs. And in fact, uh, our tourist population in the summer is mostly Northern Europeans who actually come here, you know, for the 100 and 110 and 115 degree heat. And it's, they, they're laying out by the pool in a continuous sauna. And we always, you know, you say, boy, what a bunch of idiots. Well, they're not a bunch of idiots. They're actually getting heat therapy. Yeah. It's very important. You know, our bodies were honed in the hot East African sun. And Absolutely. so, and, and they know that heat can kill you. Um, but at the, so at the same time, you know, we're hardwired with these, uh, little genetic apps that kick in when we are under the threat of heat stress and, you know, too much heat will kill you. Obviously the same way that too much exercise, uh, could kill you. Drinking too much water can kill you, but there seems to be this narrow range where, um, you know, sitting in a sauna, engaging in high intensity exercise really seems to, um, bring about very positive biochemical changes 
um, which leads to enhanced uh, cellular resilience. And this benefits the way that your brain works, as well as helps protect it against disease in the long term. Okay, so we're going to take some fish oil, we're going to pour olive oil on everything, and as you know, my favorite saying is the only purpose of food is to get olive oil into your mouth. We're going to do some saunas, or we're going to do some high-intensity exercise. Give me one last thing that we shouldn't do that we're currently doing um, to really help our brains. So... For the last tip, I would say, you know, uh, there's no need to eat constantly throughout the day. Um, there's now a lot of buzz surrounding intermittent fasting and various fasting protocols. Um, you know, we didn't always have food around. We weren't always able to summon our food with a few swipes on our smartphone. There weren't supermarkets on every corner. There weren't corners for the vast majority of our evolution. <laughs> Fruit was available seasonally. Um, we had to really work hard for our food. In fact, we had to chase our food um, for the vast, vast, vast majority of our evolution. So today, the balance between being in a fed and fasted state has been lost. We are chronically in the fed state. The lever is jammed with us constantly eating from sun up to sundown. So one of the recommendations in my book that I make is rather than get hung up over the details of how many hours you're fasting, is that most people will benefit from not eating for an hour or two after they wake up and not eating for two to three hours before they go to sleep. So it really simplifies uh, the notion of intermittent fasting, gets the numbers out of the way, and it basically just says, you know, when you're waking up, you have a hormonal milieu, a hormonal environment in your body that wants to burn fat, and your brain loves to burn fat. I mean, certainly burning fat makes us look better in bathing suits um, come beach season, but the brain loves to partake in that party because when your brain is running off fat as a fuel source, it's a very clean burning fuel. And um, when we wake up in the morning, cortisol is the body's chief catabolic hormone. It basically is elevated. It's the highest that it's going to be throughout the day, the day, generally speaking. And it wants to liberate stored fats, stored sugars, stored amino acids, all for use as fuel. And too often we thwart the opportunity that our brain has to use fat for fuel because we eat first thing in the morning. And especially in the modern world, we're eating carb-rich foods. Um, that's not good because, you know, cortisol is the body's chief catabolic hormone. It wants to break things down. And carbs cause insulin to become elevated, which is the body's chief anabolic or building up and growing hormone. It's the body's chief growth hormone. So you don't want to have those two hormones elevated simultaneously. From an evolutionary standpoint, it makes no sense. Your body gets totally confused. So when cortisol is elevated in the morning, you don't want to eat, or if you do eat, you want it to be mostly fat and protein. And you want to really stop, you know, have your first bite maybe an hour or two or even three after waking up. That allows your body to really um, uh, promote fat oxidation, which is really beneficial to the brain, it seems. Um, and then before bed, you know, first of all, your body wants to wind down at night. So, um, you know, metabolism slows. Uh, but also, while you sleep, your brain undergoes many sort of custodial maintenance processes. Something called the glymphatic system becomes activated in the brain, which turns your brain sort of into a dishwasher where cerebrospinal fluid gets swooshed all throughout the brain, purging it of toxins that build up during the day. So this is a newly discovered system. We don't have all the answers. We probably don't even have a fraction of the answers, but it's believed that by having insulin elevated uh, during this cleanup process that the brain undergoes every single night, um, it might interfere with that uh, process. So I advise not eating for two to three hours before you go to sleep. Or again, if you do, sticking to foods that don't uh, stimulate insulin so fattier foods, nuts perhaps, um, and foods that have a little bit of protein maybe, um, although protein does stimulate insulin, but to a much lesser degree than carbs, um, and really sort of, uh, you know, regaining that balance yeah. between being in a, a fasted and fed state. I think that's very important. Yeah. So that, yeah, that was... great recommendation. Thanks, Doctor. Yeah. I, uh, again, as a as as a as a baby boomer, uh, my our parents would tell us that we couldn't go swimming for an hour after we had lunch uh, because we would get horrible cramps and die and uh, drown. And there was actually some truth to that wise tale that dovetails into what you just said: is that after we eat, we 
put a lot of our blood flow down into our intestines for the purpose of digestion. And it's actually shunted away from the brain. And the brain is by far the hungriest, most energy needing organ we have. And some of Dale Bredesen's work has shown that if you eat near the time of going to sleep, what's happened is your blood flow, which prompts this lymphatic washing of your brain, is diverted down to your gut. And it isn't up in the brain to take this cleaning washing machine uh, to full power. And so, uh, yeah, the, the only, you know, don't eat when you first get up. I mean, when we came out of our cave, uh, we didn't say what's for breakfast. Uh, there was no breakfast. You know, there wasn't a refrigerator. There wasn't a storage system. And we had to find breakfast. And quite frankly, it probably took us many hours to find breakfast. And so, yeah, so millennials, uh, you know, listen to your head brain neuron millennial here. Get genius foods. It's the work of genius in the forms of Mac. There it is. Get this book. Enjoy it. It's an easy read. And, uh, you know, even a blonde from New York can get it, like <laughs> Mac started the, the story with. I don't think he meant to imply that blondes were going to get dementia, but uh, they don't. Mm. Uh, my, wife's, my wife's a blonde, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Max, good luck with the book. I know it's going to be phenomenal. Um, bless you for all the research you've done, and can't wait to see you in person one of these days again soon. Same, Dr. G. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. 